Okay, hello and welcome to our Wednesday night live stream. I am your host, Dana Morningstar, and this is a live stream that I try and do every Wednesday evening at 8.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So if you are new here, welcome, and if you are returning here, welcome. Uh, if you'd like to be notified of when I go live, you can subscribe to the text alert system by uh, texting the words Dana Live, all one word, to the number 22999. So let's see, people are trickling in here and let me make a comment in the chat to open up the chat. Okay, Jack is here. Hello, Jack. Embers, welcome, welcome. And I wanted to um, pick up where we left off last week, uh, which was, let me find the question exactly here. <laughs> so, okay, so the question we left off with last week was uh, basically, could I speak a little bit about dissociative identity disorder and whether it's possible to get it after narcissistic abuse? So, um, okay, so kind of some of the prevailing thoughts on dissociative identity disorder is it's, it's thought to stem. And, I, and when I say thought to stem, like 99 probably, possibly even greater than 99% of the cases of it stem from um, re repeating re or recurrent uh, childhood trauma, generally before the person is of the age of six. So now there's a couple different things here. So there's um, a person could experience, um, you know, emotional and psychological abuse, kind of narcissistic abuse before the age of six, and then go on to develop uh, DID. Normally signs and symptoms are present by the time the person's eight, around the age of 16. So it's, uh, I think, very infrequent that you see signs and symptoms develop later on in life. Now this is, okay, so there's just, there's a lot to cover here. So there's a couple of things. Um, so with that being said, disassociation, is in, it, in, in and of itself, it's a way that we, it's something that we all do. And it's a way that we handle uh, kind of, it's, well, not the only way, but it's one of the ways that we handle uncomfortable feelings, stress, boredom, um, kind of frustration, you name it, people zone out. It's the degree and frequency of disassociation that was where it becomes um, concerning. So with DID, it's, it's more than that. It's more than just kind of, um, uh, you know, leaving your body, zoning out, feeling like things are a movie. It's the development of um, two or more alters. So, and, and again, a lot of this is um, kind of debated and um, contested. There's just not a lot that's known about what's going on there. Some schools of thought, and this is kind of where I tend to lean into is that it's not necessarily that the alters that develop that it's all it's all parts of the same self that it's different parts of that self that surface and in, in order to um, kind of respond to the challenges of life so so that's kind of what makes did unique and different compared to, to regular kind of run-of-the-mill disassociation. Um, and now disassociation to also to a, an abnormal degree is very common with PTSD and or PTSD, I should say like PTSD-like responses. So after a, tra a traumatic event, whatever that event might be, could be house fire, could be car accident, could be uh, an abusive relationship, it could be a one-time thing, it could be an ongoing thing. Um, when some 
form of unprocessed trauma is present, a person's going to be responding to that more likely than not. And they're, they're probably going to experience things that they haven't experienced before because uh, it's out of the, it's out of the ordinary. They don't have um, kind of that learned skill set with how to handle uh, extreme, extreme stress that goes along with trauma like that. So um, with that said, with most traumatic things, symptoms tend to um, kind of settle down. There's that initial like kind of, uh, kind of spiking period that lasts maybe a couple of weeks after the event where a person feel they're very not, not present. They're, um, they're feeling like their life, they feel out of their body. They feel like things are just very surreal. They don't know what's going on. They don't remember what they're doing or how they got there. It, it's just, it's very feeling very discombobulated, uh, with PTSD that it's, it's longer lasting. So feeling that way, you know, like let's say after, after 9-11 or, um, especially, I think probably a lot of people experienced that feeling of everything was just incredibly surreal. Um, on a, um, a personal note, when I had, I was in a house fire a couple years ago and one of, and I thought I was, was, I thought I was okay. <laughs> like I knew it was traumatic, but I didn't realize kind of that I was in shock and that I was disassociating as much as I was. And there was one time where I went to an event and I walked in the door and I was talking to the, the gal at the front desk and I looked down and I, I, was, I wasn't dressed appropriately at all. Like I had on um, kind of these, I don't know, these shorts that I've owned forever that are all ratty. They're super comfortable. <laughs> they're, they have a holes in them, they're all ratty. And I was wearing flip-flops. And it was just because I hadn't looked at the bottom half of my body. I was getting ready and was, you know, and I was, I was just so apologetic. I'm like, I am so sorry. I, I don't, I'm so sorry to show up like this. Um, I don't know what I was thinking. And then I realized I don't really have any other clothes. Like everything's gone. So it, it was, it was just very, very surreal. So that, that kind of level, but then those, some, those, that level of, of shock and, and feeling disconnected and yeah, very fragmented, that settled down in, in a couple weeks. So PTSD, it does not. And PTSD, there's also other symptoms besides disassociation with PTSD. So I guess the, the point I'm trying to make is for if, if um, recurrent childhood trauma isn't present and you're feeling uh, this level of like fragmentation, things are very surreal, um, you know, all of that after traumatic event as an adult, there's a good chance that there's some PTSD present. And um, um, one of the things with PTSD too is research has shown that the, uh, the kind of the sooner a person gets treatment after trauma, the better the outcomes are. And one of the probably um, one of the um, like more highly touted uh, therapies at this point for trauma for PTSD it's it's a therapy known as EMDR it's eye movement desensitization and reprocessing. The good news with this is uh, you can see some pretty significant. Uh, shifts in a relatively short amount of time I'm talking within like. A few sessions, so that's that's pretty. That can be very encouraging. And here's the thing too with EMDR is even if you have a regular therapist that you see who's not trained in EMDR, you can go to another therapist just for EMDR. It, there is no overlap or conflict with um, the the regular approach that your regular therapist uses. So that's. That's just something to take into consideration. Uh, another thing that I wanted to talk about with uh, disassociation is there's a therapy out there called uh, internal family systems. And it's fascinating. There hasn't been, so I had to do some digging because I'm not, uh, I wasn't really up to speed. You know, DID, it's less than 1% of the population. Um, it's 
yeah, it's very, very rare. So there has there hasn't been a lot of research on it in terms of kind of effective treatments. And um, one of the things that I've been really big into lately uh, is internal family systems. And this is a therapy where a person, the approach is that we all have different parts to ourselves. And so it kind of starts off with the assumption of um, kind of the altered part of DID. So with DID, there's alters that surface. Internal family systems is we all, to some degree, have have these quote unquote alters. Um, there's different categories of ourself that surfaces. Um, we have a, there's the manager, there's the exile, and there's the firefighter. And there might, there might be a couple more, it depends. There's a couple different branches of internal family systems as well. And so the whole concept behind that, it's to approach it in a way, in, in thinking of it in a way of that it's not a, not a pathology, which I'm a, I'm a big fan of. I'm a big fan of like strengths-based everything. So it views it in terms of that all of these different parts of ourself surface for a reason. And that reason is to keep us safe. And now with that said, if we have, if we're kind of over reliant on one, um, one part or you know, kind of one identity, if one identity is kind of driving the, the, the ship more often than the others, there's, there's probably going to be problems. There's going to be things that are out of balance there. And so what makes internal family systems therapy different is you have, it's just, it's really cool. <laughs> so it, it's um, helping the person to identify these, these different parts of themselves and then talking to that self and figuring out, okay, well, why is the manager present and what, it, or what is the firefighter? The firefighter is like more of the reactive emotional center, the manager, it's very um, kind of task oriented. Um, uh, the exile is um, oh, kind of like the, like the lost part of ourself or the hurt part of ourself. So the, the goal with internal family systems isn't to get rid of these different selves, it's to help integrate them. So that we're all that we're able to transition in and out of the appropriate self at the appropriate time, and to to be able to listen to them and get the messages that we need, so we can take appropriate action. Um, it's fascinating, and there's been a lot of work done with internal family systems and addictions and eating disorders. So, um, yeah. So I guess just kind of let that be known. It's it's very. Uh, it's very interesting. There's, like I said, there's different branches, different therapies that have kind of spun off from um, uh, the internal, like I IFS is what it's known as, internal family systems. There's a, like a parts therapy. That one's a little different in that the person is uh, um, coming up with, the, the parts aren't clustered in kind of the, those three areas of a manager, firefighter, or exile. It's the part could be, um, okay, this is my eight-year-old self, or this is my angsty teenager self, or this is my kind of, um, this is my no-nonsense uh, boundary setting self. And a person, there's, there's, a, so there's a lot more range of, of openness in terms of exploring all these different parts, giving them names, um, and yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting stuff. So I hope, I hope that that, that that helps. And then, well, and I should also add with um, uh, IFS. In particular, it's the concept that the that the core self, this deeper sense of self, is remains undamaged by everything, and that it kind of moderates all of these different parts. So, um, yeah, this kind of helps bring balance to everything, especially when these different parts are integrated. So, okay, that's that. Then I had a question. 
Somebody emailed me. Um, so, okay, this is kind of long. I'll see if I can, I might just have to, to read it. <laughs> but if you have a question that you would like answered in a future live stream, you can email me at dana at thriveafterabuse.com and let me know what name you would like for me to read on the air. So this question says, hi, Dana, I hope you're well. First and foremost, thank you for your work on narcissistic abuse. Out of the fog and the narcissist playbook have been absolutely life-saving tools after coming out of an abusive situation with someone that showed narcissistic and dark triad personality traits. Your work has been my survival guide and I'm truly grateful for your advocacy. Well, thank you. Um, Last year, I crossed paths with a seemingly wonderful coworker who lived in a neighboring town. I was in a vulnerable state of mind, struggling with the loss of a friend, a family member, an OCD flare-up, a distressing job, and stress surrounding the declining state of another family member's health. I fell hard and fast for the love bombing and see that I quickly became trauma-bonded. Everything was as you described in your books, and I felt a true soulmate connection only a month into the quote-unquote manipulationship. A few months in, the hot and cold cycle set in, and I found myself completely addicted to this mirage of a person that would constantly keep me in a state of fear and confusion. Whenever I sensed problematic drinking, lying, and that things were quote-unquote off, his close-knit team of flying monkeys were always around to launch a personal PR campaign for him and keep the show going. I was addicted to the show and the crumbs of kindness thrown my way. After seven months of an emotional roller coaster, I was moved to the devalue and discard stage. This was during a time in which I needed a friend the most. I became very clingy and shamefully admit to begging the narcissist to come back into my life after they had moved on and agreed to keep me around or in the pipeline. During my grand finale scene with the narcissist who was into BDSM, he put me through a sexual scene that I did not agree to, nor did I know much about healthy BDSM other than Fifty Shades of Grey and sensationalized versions. Um, and the Fifty Shades of Grey just is on an aside is not healthy at all. It's very abusive. Uh, okay, so we had not seen each other for a month and the narcissist was clear he'd moved on and was checking on me as a favor because he was such a good friend. I did not expect anything sexual and went into freeze mode when he went to demonstrate what I thought would be a rock climbing knot, since this was an activity we had done and practiced together. I was so paralyzed that I just let the scene happen and only remember trying to climb out of a window and asking him to leave and saying nonsensical things, all of which we were used, all of which were used to evidence my weakness and how wonderful his new girlfriend was after the fact. Oh, gosh. The day after I let months of rage surrounding mistreatment explode and sent a barrage of admittedly unbecoming messages, no profanity, demanding payment for the medical expenses I would need to meet my medical deductible for an experience I felt coerced into. I received a courtesy call shortly after doing so from a police officer in the town. The narcissist lived in the neighboring town and had worked at the same company stating that I was not to contact the narcissist and could be charged with harassment if I did. When I tried to explain what happened, he said it would pass and I'd have to take it up with another police department. It later became clear that this was a family friend as it was a small town. I felt as though I was a truly awful human being and solely responsible for everything that happened. I do struggle with OCD, preoccupied anxious attachments, and my fear is hurting others. I really make a conscious effort not to be controlling and generally dislike suggesting to someone how to live their life. Still in this situation, I did want the narcissist to feel badly and I did rage at him in a response to the assault. While there is a lot, while there is a lot I was not aware of before the relationship and educating myself with your work, I am really struggling with realizing my part. I did go to a therapist that after a few sessions found that I was not really obtaining a lot of the clarity that I needed to be able to discern if I inherited too many problematic traits to ever think to apply healthy narcissism to a relationship. I did embrace a lot of the fleas and or problematic behaviors that were mentioned in your work. I did rage, react, and also seek to launch a smear campaign against him because I did want to show the person that hurting others was wrong all of which I now regret and feel really guilty about. 
Still, I am truly afraid that I inherited all of these problematic traits and cannot change and will hurt someone else. He has moved on to some other poor target, but seems so happy. I'm devastated to think that maybe he was right and that I'm a manipulative, vindictive harasser. After all, the police officer did use this term against me and not him. I have tried to avoid others in fear that I will hurt them. I never intended to harass him, but I did want him to feel badly and sent many messages to try to get my point across and payment for a large medical deductible. Do you think it is possible to rid myself of the quote unquote fleas that I've inherited? I really do not want to hurt anyone ever, not intentionally. I am so sorry for my behavior. I just don't know if that's enough. I am so afraid to enter into a new relationship because I saw how unhinged I could get and I really don't want to ever feel or behave that way again. With much gratitude, a grateful fan striving to heal and help others. Okay, so with all of that said, here here are my thoughts on this. It sounds it sounds like you were at a minimum assaulted. I don't know if this scene led to anything sexual. If it did, then that would be sexual assault. So you did not consent to it. Um, and uh, any, um, it sounds like you were coerced into it and that it led to uh, medical expenses. So it, makes a lot of sense to me as to why you would feel victimized because you were victimized. And when, when a person feels victimized, they, they feel they're full of rage. Maybe not at first, maybe at first there's confusion or numbness, or um, they're kind of struggling to understand things, but in time, anger and rage do tend to surface. Those are normal, healthy, reasonable responses to being victimized. So, uh, and, and as far as kind of sending this barrage of text messages, wanting to um, kind of wanting him to know like, hey, you, this really hurt me. This was, you know, you owe me money, like kind of what the hell kind of a thing. Um, I think given the situation, that's a, it's a normal, it's a normal understandable response. Is it, is it necessarily ideal? No, but kind of when a person feels powerless in a situation like that, there's this driving need to, to be heard and to be validated and um, to kind of to have justice, to have some sort of justice prevail, whatever, even if it's not legal justice, but for them to say, okay, yeah, you know what, you're right, that I took it a little bit too far. Here's, here's the money for your deductible or something. There, there's some sort of need for, for, for clarity and uh, for justice. So I don't think that your response in this situation, I, I, I would categorize under, actually, I know I would not categorize it under fleas because this was a one-time extreme event. It was traumatic. It was assault. You were victimized and you lashed out. Um, now, with that said, kind of moving forward into other relationships. Um, well, actually, let me, let me back up. You said, you know, he seems so happy now and this other relationship and, and all of that. This is, this can trip up a lot of people, but keep in mind, you're looking from the outside in, you're not seeing the full picture. And what we do know about this person is that he has no respect for boundaries and that he's okay with assaulting and hurting other people. And he's not accountable for his actions. None of that is safe behavior. All of that is incredibly problematic and none of that makes for a, a quality partner or a workable relationship. So this other woman may or may not have seen that yet. And what's really tragic is she might be coming to the situation with her own ideas about uh, um, kind of domination and submission and, um, or her own uh, previous abuse history, which um, can really, really lead to very complicated, a very complicated outcome and a very tragic outcome. So, um, okay. So in terms of moving forward now, you're saying that you are avoiding others in fear that you will hurt them. 
you experienced something incredibly traumatic and it wasn't just this one time assault where you were coerced into doing something you didn't want to do. And then it, not only were you coerced into it, there, there was, there were no boundaries around it. Uh, and it led to the point of actually needing to get medical attention. It sounds like there was probably a lot of uh, imbalances in your relationship up, up to that point. Um, and you know, it's, again, it's understandable that you would feel very traumatized if you were traumatized. And a part of feeling traumatized, it's that emotional dysregulation. It's, it can be that emotional explosiveness or feeling uh, very kind of quote unquote triggered. So, and, or being activated. Somebody says or does something and ding, we just shoot all the way up to the ceiling. Um, our kind of level of um, our frustration level, our um, kind of the way that we engage with others, it, it, it can change. And so because of that, um, I would encourage you, if you do seek out um, therapy again, to try to find a therapist um, who has a trauma-informed um, trauma informed background and ideally somebody that is skilled in EMDR, I think would help tremendously. Um, I don't think, I don't think that you're, um, you know, um, you said, you know, you just don't want to hurt anybody, anyone ever that you're terrified of this, um, you know, kind of moving, I guess what I'm saying is I don't think that you're a lost cause. And this sounds like a fairly recent thing. There, there is this acknowledgement of, oh my gosh, my behavior, it's really extreme. This is not, I don't want to be yelling at people. I don't want to be um, so easily activated. But, you know, I say that, but at the same time, again, the only experience that you've had with this level of activation was with somebody who abused you. And, and that that's known as reactive abuse. And that's, you know, that's pretty normal. Any sane, reasonable, balanced person has their breaking point. And when someone really just crosses our boundaries to such an extent, it's, although it's not, um, you know, it's like society frowns upon it, the law frowns upon it. It's understandable that uh, it's not just coming out of cl the clear blue, like there's a reason behind that level of lashing out. So in terms of interacting with other people, um, in terms of interacting with other people kind of from here on out, it's, um, you know, there might be times when you do um, have a very reactive response and that's okay. That's okay. We all, I think anybody that's gone through anything that we've gone through is it, it there's this period of kind of readjustment to where that that emotional reactivity, that franticness, the 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 traumatized self kind of gets back to normal. And and so I guess I would encourage you to um, to yeah, to spend some time in therapy with a trauma focused therapist and to those people in your life, if you do end up, Brene Brown calls it chandeliering, where we're easily activated and then we go straight up to the, the chandelier, basically, and we're hanging off the chandelier. If you find yourself chandeliering, uh, being accountable for that and trying to notice, okay, are there certain patterns here, like what's going on um, that's, that happened right before I felt this way? What I have noticed in my personal life is the more, the more familiar you become with the language of healing. So different terms, different terms and concepts. Well, I should say the more you become familiar with the language of abuse and the language of healing, the more these moments of, of outrage, of um, upset, of emotional dysregulation, the more you'll be able to to identify them and to, to 
be able to understand and explain them to yourself and to others. We really struggle when we go from zero to 10 and we're like, I just don't know why. Or we're like, I don't know, I just got really angry. When there might be something deeper there, it might be like, well, you know what, this person crossed a boundary with me, or I, was, I wasn't feeling heard, or um, you know, I felt like they just kind of kept pushing me to do what they wanted to do. So getting, getting clear on, okay, well, what's behind that anger or frustration? What was behind that activation? This can take some doing because I think a lot of us kind of what, um, oh, kind of a re repeating theme as uh, personality traits, I should say, that get us uh, into these situations or lead us to kind of stay in these situations is there's this disconnection to our, to ourself that we've picked up somewhere along the line that our wants and needs, our thoughts and opinions aren't as valid as other people. We put other people's stuff first and then we turn down the volume on our own stuff. And this can be to such a concerning degree that we don't know. We don't know how we feel. We don't know even on a physical level. It's not just emotional. It's not just a um, oh, I'm angry or I'm sad or I'm glad or I'm hurt. It's, I also don't know how I feel physically. I'm not quite sure if I really am in pain unless it's extreme. Uh, but we have a hard time kind of just being in tune with, um, with ourselves. And that's a process that takes time. So I would just encourage you to give yourself the compassion and grace for, um, kind of for where you are and handling things the best way that you could at the time. And uh, yeah, reaching out for some support. Another thought too would be to call a local domestic violence agency and to talk to them. So they oftentimes offer um, generally free, free therapy. They have a lot of resources out there. They might even be able to actually most domestic violence agencies can even help with medical bills. So I would encourage you to call them and, and see. So good luck with all that. And thank you so much for, for, for sharing your experience. I hope that, um, I hope that something I said was able to, to help. So, okay. So let's see with this, let's scroll back into scroll back. Let's go hop back into the chat. And let me scroll here. Uh, Big D says, I did EMDR. I felt horrible at first after doing a session, but I felt the best I have after a week or two. So, you know, you bring up a really great point and that with EMDR process and really most therapy in general, processing doesn't just stop at the end of the session. Processing, especially with EMDR, continues afterwards. So um, having kind of vivid, bizarre, strange dreams is not an un, unheard of. Uh, kind of just th that level of processing continues for um, at, the, at the, you know, generally at a more intense level, a few days after the session, generally that night. And then, uh, yeah, so it's not uncommon for, um, for that. So I'm, I'm really glad that you brought that up. Because a lot of people will come back and they're uh, they'll sh they're shocked of like oh my gosh I uh, kind of this is something that's different or I can't, I've responded to this certain event in a different way and um, I had this thought or man I was having some really wild dreams you know or uh, yeah and that's just kind of the processing the brain is a fascinating thing. So, and also I wanted to mention too, with EMDR, it, it's, 
not just for trauma. It's for kind of any, really, I think anything that is stressful or uncomfortable, anything where there could put, has the potential to be some limiting beliefs present uh, that can be done, that can be addressed in EMDR. It's pretty cool stuff, I have to say. Okay, and Rosie, so Huffle Mom struggles with DID. And so one of her alters name is Rosie. And okay, so Rosie was saying that my mama is the one in charge of our headspace. What she says goes. I don't always like it, but I do what she says because I want to be a good girl. Yes. Well, welcome. Welcome here. It's, it's fascinating, these different parts, parts of ourselves. There can be that kind of a good girl part. There can be the, the bad girl part. There can be the kind of, um, you know, critical parent self. Um, yeah, lot, lots of selves that can surface. Okay, I see I'm scrolling up here. <laughs> Kayla says, allowing a healthy outlet for uncomfortable emotions rather than denying them. Anger is a natural response to mistreatment. Not feeling anything is the problem, not your discomfort. Yes, very well said. Absolutely. There is absolutely this gift of anger. And if we can kind of change the, the way that we view our emotions and realize that our emotions are there because they have a message for us. And if we can, can befriend, befriend them, realizing they're just messengers, they come and they go, they're generally there for a reason. And if we can take the message, then the messenger tends to leave. And anger at the core, it's, it's an emotion of self-protection. So it's designed to let us know that somebody did something that's not okay with us. And one of the ways that that, that anger is able to uh, kind of be discharged is when we're able to take some sort of self-protective action, either uh, getting distance from that person, setting a boundary. This is, this is the challenge that I think a lot of us in this um, that have experienced abuse space is that anger is righteous anger. So it, and because that level of communication goes undelivered, um, where you know, we're, we're victimized, but then we're just left. Like there's nothing that you can do about it. It's that feeling of helplessness. And, and so the, this, this kind of inherent human drive to have justice goes unanswered. And so then that can leave a person feeling in this holding pattern of, well, I'm just, I'm incredibly angry. I don't know what to do about it. Um, and you know, I can't, the, the other person doesn't care or they're blaming me or I'm not getting the, the validation that I'm needing in order to kind of soothe that, uh, that sense of myself that that's feeling victimized because I was victimized. So that's one of the biggest challenges in healing is, is handling and processing righteous anger. And I think our, our body and our mind want to hang on to it because it's righteous. It's like, no, this person hurt me, you know, kind of F them. And we want to put up walls. We want to carry that grudge because it feels like, well, okay, this is the only justice I'm going to have. And I don't want the world or I don't want this other person to think that how they treated me is somehow okay because it's not. And one of the biggest challenges in healing is realizing um, that, that yes, 
getting validation or giving yourself validation um, instead of looking around at the abusive person or even other people in your life and, and hoping to get some sort of answers or closure or apologies or any of that from them that we're going to have to validate ourselves. And this is why support groups can be really helpful for that of, yeah, what you went through was not right. It was not fair. It shouldn't have happened. You didn't deserve it. That's it. Period. It's abuse is never okay. So, um, and then working with that anger, uh, to realize that you can still keep yourself safe, that somebody absolutely violated your boundaries, but you don't need that anger to keep you, to keep you safe. It might feel that way, but you can replace that anger, needing that anger to keep you safe with boundaries. Whereas before, I think there's a lot of us who didn't have, didn't really understand the concept of boundaries or yeah, we just didn't, didn't have, weren't grounded in that for whatever reason. We might've thought we were, but we weren't. And so as a result, we went from being passive and accepting this mistreatment for any number of reasons, for cultural reasons, for religious reasons, for really messed up ideas we had about love or relationships or commitment or you name it, feeling that we had to just stay and take it, that this other person was probably blaming, blaming you for their abuse. So being confused, um, you know, all kinds of things. And um, you know, so going from being passive and not saying anything and just taking it to having things build up, build up, build up to the point where you finally, that anger gets so intense that we're, that we lash out and actually take some sort of self-protective action. We end the relationship, we uh, get a restraining order. We, you know, we start doing things different. We're kind of that kicked into gear of, okay, now I'm going to, I need to start protecting myself from this person or this situation. And um, a lot of time can go by before we realize, well, because a lot of people, let me back up a little bit. It's that fear of this is the, the anger is keeping me safe because in the past, that was what they had to rely on because they didn't know any other way of keeping themselves safe. And so there's that fear of, okay, what if I lose the anger? I don't want to like slip into complacency and then somehow just, you know, I don't know, kind of get talked into or things gravitate towards me being okay with this abusive person. Like, I feel like I need to stay angry at them so I can remind myself that they're, that they're, that they treat me horribly and I can't be around that. But if we can replace that anger with healthy functional boundaries, then that'll keep us safe. So, okay, so let me scroll down here. Well, I speak my truth says, well, Dana, if you can survive a house fire, I can survive breaking a trauma bond, even if that means losing my mind or becoming an atheist or whatever it takes. Well, and I just, I guess I just want to know there are different types of, there are different types of trauma. So, um, yeah, there are just different types of trauma. So I guess I'm saying that because I, I don't want you to minimize what you're going through. Um, but yeah, you can absolutely, you can absolutely break it. One of the ways that I think is the, that helps tremendously with breaking a trauma bond um, is, is to expand your support network, to kind of get out there, meet some new people. And one of the reasons I think that this works so well is with trauma bonds, especially, there's this, this added like feeling of scarcity. So it's not only that level of intensity with that person. There's also that feeling of, I need them and only them. And if they leave, I'm going to die. Like it can just feel like that level of intensity. So kind of realizing, um, in part, okay, that this is not true. 
that that's more of a the kind of that's the anxiety speaking. That's more of that anxious style of attachment or the anxiety that goes along with the trauma bond. That that's not real. Life will continue. You had a life before this person. You will have a life after this person. Um, reminding yourself of that, but then also hopefully when kind of the world starts to return more towards normal, joining meetup groups and getting out there. I'm not encouraging anybody to date, but getting out there, meeting new people can really reinforce that idea of your life isn't going to, doesn't start and stop with this other person or with this relationship. Like there are other relationships possible out there with actual quality people. So it, it helps tremendously. It's the anxiety part of the trauma bond, I think is probably one of the, the toughest parts of that to break because it can just, man, it just can really just grab a hold of your brain and it can feel so real. Just, it's that level of kind of unhinged neediness of, um, you know, where you're kind of stalking that person online or you're wanting, you're checking your phone every five minutes or you're, you're feeling like I need them and only them. Um, but yeah, it helps to just ground yourself realizing, you know what, you had a life before this person, you will have a life after this person. This isn't the, a relationship that's a kind of once in your lifetime. It's just a relationship in your lifetime. There will be others out there. And that this is, this was not, this is not something that's quality. It's not worth hang, worth, worth hanging on to. One of the ways that I've described this in the past is um, it's kind of part of the trauma bond. It's that false sense of security that this kind of basically, gar <laughs> I don't mean this uh, to sound maybe as bad as it's going to sound, but it's it's kind of okay. It's along the lines of having a food, having a refrigerator full of rotten food and having that sense of security of, okay, well, I know, you know, I know this food's not like, you know, really like perfectly fresh, but it's, it's good enough, right? Like it gets the job done. And so then there can be this, this terror of going through and cleaning out your fridge. Cause it's like, well, gosh, if I clean out my fridge, I'm not going to have any food left. I would actually throw away everything that's rotten. And I don't want to do that because I don't know when I'm going to be able to go shopping next. So I better keep all of this rotten food in there just in case. It's a, kind of like the brain does the same thing with trauma bonds. Like it, it knows that this relationship is going to help you. It's better than nothing kind of a thing. And so that's why with cleaning out your fridge, it helps to know, okay, you know what? I'm going to go grocery shopping tomorrow. Then your brain is more able to kind of let go and be like, okay, there's that sense of reassurance of I will be okay. And I can toss out all the stuff that's moldy or like way expired, um, you know, stuff that smells bad. Like I don't need to try to make do with this, that I will be okay. And with relationships, building up that social support and starting and getting out there and meeting some new people. And again, for right now, it's, you know, online, but hopefully not for too much longer. Even if you're not meeting like your kind of people still meeting people where there's that sense of connection. And even if they're not people that you would want to date, but just going out and having a good time with people, uh, making whatever connections that you're making, it just helps to relax the brain so much, especially for those that really struggle with that anxious style of attachment. And then, then when that softens up, then start working on, um, moving more towards a secure attachment style and what all that involves. And that's a whole nother topic. Maybe we can dive more into that next week. So, um, oh, well, good. Kayla says, I'm now 11 days, no contact after months of gradually distancing. And I'm finally making breakthroughs, making new like-minded friends makes all the difference, positive and inspired. Finally. Awesome. Yay. You, that's a huge victory. I'm just thrilled for you. Okay. Let's see. Let me scroll up here.
Jack mentions two uh, dialectical behavioral therapy, DBT. He says it's done quite a bit for my complex PTSD. Yeah. Uh, DBT, there's so many wonderful skills that are, are involved in DBT and uh, uh, mindfulness, kind of emotional regulation, uh, different kinds of grounding skills. If you're interested in DBT, again, kind of when you're looking around for a therapist, uh, see if one is, is trained in DBT. So some places have more of a formalized um, training or like a, what is not training, um, uh, kind of formalized process that people can go through. Others, others run groups, others just do one-on-one, -on -one, others kind of integrate it into whatever modality of therapy that they normally use. So, yeah. Um, I speak my truth says, what do you do when you have to force yourself to move out because moving out makes you angry and detaching from them makes you so angry because you love them yet they're unsafe. Okay. Let me try to figure that out. What do you do when you have to force yourself to move out because moving out makes you angry and detaching from them makes you angry because you love them, but yet they're unsafe. Okay. So if I understand your question correctly, it sounds like, how do you handle how do you handle needing to move out and have and having that boundary of what's keeping you healthy and balance that with that feeling of responsibility that they're unsafe? Is that correct? So I guess if that's correct, then um, kind of realizing that, I guess kind of realizing that that's, uh, an example of a very blurred or enmeshed boundary. So if we're, if one adult, especially the child, if the child is feeling this level of accountability for the parent's well-being, that's, um, that's a problem. So, and it's an example, it's like I said, it's a very blurred boundary there. So realizing that as not even just parent child dynamic, but adult adult dynamic that if that adults are responsible for themselves, so that you is not um, kind of reasonable or healthy for you to stay in a situation that is absolutely destroying you because you're concerned um, about to, to stay in a situation where you're being abused by your a parent because you're concerned about leaving that abusive parent. Uh, and this is very, it's very difficult to, to detach from that. But the reality is that as adults, we're all responsible for ourselves. And if there's something really, um, you know, pathologically, or if they were talking like mental illness or something like that, that's going on with your mom, then that would warrant a call to adult protective services. But that's way outside what is um, and requires trained professionals. So if you're if you have a parent who's you know not emotionally stable, they're suicidal. There's untreated mental illness going on. There's all kinds of these things. But at the same time, being under that roof or having a very close relationship with you with them is putting you in harm's way. Then then staying in harm's way is not a solution to that problem. And so then we need to find another type of solution. And that's where, um, you know, potentially adult protective services can come into play. If their behavior is not to that level, or you're, cons you know, you're, if you feel like, you know, they're, they're, they have maladaptive ways of handling the world, but they're not necessarily a danger to themselves. Um, like they're still in reality, I guess is what I'm saying. Then, um, then realizing, okay, you know what, it's, this is going to be difficult. It's going to be difficult to detach and to move forward and for me to have, to try to create uh, and sustain a, a happy, healthy, well-adjusted adult life on my own, that odds are if the dynamic with your mom has been such that there's a lot of um, guilt, obligation, that there's fear of what is she going to do? What is she going to say? 
Who was she going to tell? Um, you know, all of that. Realize, okay, all of these feelings are probably going to come up. And then kind of coming up with the game plan of how are you going to handle that when that happens? And also realizing that you're not responsible for her feelings. So you having, you moving out and being an adult and being on your own, it's not to punish your mom, even though that it's an abusive situation and it's not healthy for you, it's still not to punish your mom. You're moving out in order to, to be self-protective in order to get sanity and peace back in your life. And that she's going to feel how she's going to feel about that, but that you're not responsible for her emotions. And then practicing that skill that you're going to have to, uh, it, it, it's going to take a little time to, to correct that imbalanced boundary. Because that blurred boundary is what's saying, um, oh, I need to be responsible. I need to make sure that she's okay. I need to make sure that she's at peace with me moving out. If, if um, you know, I'm, that I'm accountable or responsible for her behavior. If she, you know, threatens suicide and that's my fault. Or if she, uh, if she tells me that I'm a bad person for moving out, that I'm leaving her, then she's right. So that blurred boundary part of ourself doesn't have any concept of the differentiation between us in another person. A healthy boundary is going to realize that and say, you know what, there's, we all have that. We, we all start and stop. And that's what a boundary does. And it keeps us safe. We don't have them. We don't use boundaries to punish other people. It's about keeping yourself safe. Uh, our boundaries grow and change as we grow and change. And we step into or cultivate different types of boundaries based on the different stages we are in life. And, um, and yeah, and in part of having healthy boundaries, and this is, can be very difficult. It's when we're asserting ourselves as other person, realizing that we state our boundary or we draw our boundary and then we let it go. And it's incredibly difficult to do that if we're not used to it that knee jerk reaction that can come up is that feeling of, I need to apologize. Oh my gosh, I feel terrible. I feel like I'm being mean or cruel or completely unfair or unreasonable. And I don't want them to, I don't want to hurt them. I just, I just want them to try to understand where I'm coming from. And, and it can cause all kinds of anxiety within us. And I guess, so anticipating that. And so if, and when those feelings do arise, realize, okay, you know what? This is the practice of being assertive and this is the practice of having a healthy boundary and that in order to kind of correct that imbalance that we've got to be able to self-soothe. We've got to be able to soothe ourselves when we're having anxiety over speaking up and to break that pattern. And again, this just takes time and practice to break that pattern of you know, stating our boundary and then apologizing and then trying to make everything okay. And, and then trying to soothe the other person, realizing we just need to learn how to sit in that level of discomfort and soothe ourselves because it's, it's reasonable and appropriate to have your own boundaries and to be assertive and to not be in environments that are, that are destructive or harmful to you. Okay. So let me scroll up here. <laughs> I had a question and then I lost it. Hmm. <laughs> Okay. Sorry here, scrolling, scrolling. Okay, Embers asks, this is a question for you and the Thrive Tribe. What are your most effective pattern interrupts? Okay. 
Okay, so this might seem like a small question, <laughs> but you know me, it, it's, but it's not. So let me kind of give some context before I just answer it, okay? Pattern interrupts are, are most frequently associated with cognitive behavioral therapy. So we change one something, we change. So cognitive behavioral therapy, it's kind of the connection at the core, it's thoughts, feelings, actions, right? It's kind of this triangle. And you change one of those and then it changes the other two. And so doing a pattern interrupt anywhere along the line with our thinking, our feeling, our acting is gonna change the other two things. That's powerful stuff and it's really awesome. However, when we're talking about trauma, um, there's definitely a huge aspect of CBT that can be very um, unintentionally so, but, but very minimizing and invalidating and gaslighting. And not only that, but very unhelpful. So it can feel productive because nobody, there's this idea, it's kind of along the lines of like toxic positivity of, okay, yeah, if I'm feeling a certain way, like, yeah, I got to change the state, change the, you know, change the frame, change the, do the pattern interrupt, do it, do it, do it. But the problem is there's a time and place for pattern interrupts. And then there's a problematic, then there's like that place where pattern interrupts are more in line with toxic positivity. So I guess that's kind of the, what I'm saying is the motivation behind the, the pattern interrupt. If we're doing a pattern interrupt as a way to avoid uncomfortable feelings, then on a regular basis, then that's a problem. And it can seem like, oh yeah, well, I'm doing so great, but really like we're just getting, we're, we're engaging in this um, kind of like emotional bypassing, but it feels really productive because we're doing this really great job at kind of interrupting these, these negative or uncomfortable thoughts, feelings, or actions. So let that be said, because that can be a very slippery slope. I've seen I've seen this a lot, especially, I don't know, there's a lot of life coaches that are big fans of pattern interrupt stuff. And this is why I get concerned about that kind of stuff because um, they don't have the background for trauma. So um, yeah, I guess just proceed with caution with that kind of stuff. But um, so, pat so pattern interrupts that I would recommend. Um, Oh, it can run, it just can run the gamut. I'm a big fan. What's worked for me has been um, having a mantra. So switching out my mantra kind of throughout, you know, different parts of my life when I need, I need a new one. So I'd shared before that one of the mantras I had was the best revenge is a good life. And that helped tremendously. So when I was feeling a lot of anger and resentment and rage building up, um, that I would, that gave me direction to steer into. And so instead of getting all caught up in like this emotional tsunami of rage, that was my kind of my lighthouse, like my, <laughs> like that got me out of that storm. And so I was like, okay, yes, the best revenge is a good life. And then I would, I took some time to get clear on kind of what a good life looked like. So for me, and this wasn't like this huge drawn out process. This was like, okay, it's going to involve uh, exercise or being organized or, or whatnot. And then I would go and engage in cleaning something or, um, you know, these kinds of things. I'd be curious to know anybody in the chat want to share what would be one of their normal pattern interrupts? Um, okay, let's see. Let's scroll here. Interesting. Crystal says, I'm so grateful for these online chats and communities. When I was young in the 80s, all I had were movies. 
Mommy Dearest was my therapy, as strange as that sounds. What was it about that movie, Crystal? Was it, was it validating? Um, Okay, let's see, let me scroll up here. Josie says, I've got to go take my meds now and get to sleep. It's 1030 here in Nova Scotia, Canada. Lots of love and good night. Well, good night, Josie. We'll see you next week. Yes, and Michelle, that's a really great point. She says, you know, she says, that's why it's called exercising boundaries and practicing self-care. It takes repetition. You can do it. Yes. Yes, that's the thing. Therapy, whether you're seeing a life coach or a therapist or whatever it is, there's um, the vast majority of the work takes place outside of the session. So if you're in there for, and I don't know if that's really made clear enough, frankly. Uh, so if, if there's certain skills or, um, yeah, I guess kind of certain skills or ideas that are discussed, it's, practice, it's the practicing of those skills that that's where the magic happens. So just kind of discussing them and, it kind of, everything starts and stops during that hour in your session isn't going to get very far. It's the practicing of them. That's where things start to shift. And you're going to realize so many more things. Like, so, you know, it's one thing to kind of have the knowledge of, of, of a topic of, oh, okay, this is how I'd be assertive, or this is what boundaries are. It's totally something else to actually do it. And you'll learn so much about yourself um, when you do it of kind of what comes up and, uh, you know, fear or the feeling the need to apologize or, uh, you know, yeah, all of that. So, yep, it's doing, doing the work. So, okay, let's see, let me scroll up. So Josie was saying, okay, in therapy that she felt like she was getting pushed to face her fears too fast. And so she's like, I had to quit. It was giving me panic attacks. Yeah. So this is another, I guess, great point to address is that um, if you have somebody who ideally is helping you move forward and heal, whether that person, again, life coach, therapist, psychiatrist, you name it, it's important to have to have a working relationship with them and that working relationship it, it it's important that it involves that open honest sincere solutions oriented communication to where because they don't know your inner world and it's important that that you're able to communicate that to the best of your ability and it's important that they respect that so if things are going too quick, especially to the point of panic attacks, that, um, you know, any, frankly, any clinician worth, worth their salt is going to realize that's not, that's not the goal. The goal is not to, to harm the, the person further. The, the goal is to help and to help them heal. Not necessarily, and here's the distinction too, is when, when I say the goal is to help the person, it's not necessarily to help them feel better it's to help them heal that that can be two different things because helping them heal is going to involve facing a lot of uncomfortable things however <laughs> pushing that far to where it's having it's having the opposite effect where a person's having panic attacks they feel like they're they're being pushed way far outside of their comfort zone that's um, that's not the goal 
So you really want to make sure that when you're working with somebody, and this this is can be worth, I think, having the conversation early on with them of of all of this, you know, like okay, I, I, these are some things that I want to work on. Most clinicians that are trauma informed, most clinicians in general, again, if they're if you know they're any good they're going to understand you know, people get into therapy. It's scary. It's hard to pick up the phone and make that first appointment. It's even harder to show up for that first appointment and then to be vulnerable with a stranger. And there can be all kinds of feelings that come up, that fear of being judged, that fear of losing control, the fear of the unknown. Well, what, how are they going to perceive this or how are they going to, what are they going to want me to do or um, all of this. And so that's why those, uh, conversations are important and a, and a good clinician is going to be, um, they're not going to get defensive and, and fight for, for their way of being or their, their approach. They're going to be able to, um, to be flexible because it's the, the goal is to help. Like I said, it's, the goal is to help the client heal. It's not to further traumatize them or to, um, you know, to have the client lose faith and in, in the process. So okay, so let me scroll down here. Um Okay, so Jennifer, hi Jennifer, says, actually, before I go into that, let me go back to the pattern interrupt something real quick. Kayla was saying for her, a shock of cold water is a good pattern interrupt. She said, that's my most reliable one. That's a good one. Another one, I think this is a Zig Ziglar. If you guys remember him from way back in the day, um, I'm pretty sure it was him. He you know, did a lot of like, maybe it was Brian Tracy. I don't know. It was one of those, one of those guys that taught sales and um, kind of self-help and that kind of stuff. But it was, if, if a negative thought or kind of a limiting belief, I should say, if a limiting belief surfaced, like, oh, you'll, that, that's, you know, um, why would that person uh, listen to you or why would they buy from you or you're not good enough or anytime any limiting belief came up, he would say, you say the phrase cancel, cancel. And so that would kind of shake you out of it and like, oh yeah, okay, that's a limiting belief. And then just bringing that awareness to it is a huge first step, huge, huge first step. Um, Jennifer says, I've had such a problem with that where I would be engaged in therapy, but then I would leave it afterwards. I think that's because I don't really go out anymore and I fortress myself. COVID doesn't help. And at work, I work in customer service. So it's all about the customer. It's very hard to practice assertiveness, decision-making skills, being social, boundary-making, et cetera, when all I do is work, sleep, eat, and repeat. That can be challenging. I will say so, kind of given the limitations of of that, uh, one idea would be to do some role playing with your therapist. So, and you could do it either way. You could do it to where you're the the challenging person, and your therapist is the one that's coming up with boundary setting and assertiveness and all of this, and then so she can kind of role model for you. Um, some ways of, of handling that. Uh, and then you can switch to where you're the, the one who's having to come up with the assertive statements, the boundary setting, handling things. And then she role plays the kind of the, the difficult or challenging person or scenario. That can be very helpful. So, and yeah. And it's, and it's great because it, ideally it's one of the safest places to practice those skills. 
is, you know, you know, ahead of time, okay, there's, this is very low stakes. <laughs> you know, your therapist knows what's going on. You know, what's going on. There's that agreement there that you guys have both agreed to like, okay, this is going to be a safe place for, to practice these skills and um, to discuss kind of what's coming up for you after practicing them, uh, you know, so, you know, she's not going to get mad and, and huff out or, um, you know, any of that, because it's, it's role playing. So that's, that's just the thought. I speak my truth says, how do you grieve your own mother? Because you only have one and that can't be replaced. Only self-love and self-mothering. Oh, I think you mean, and that, and that can't be replaced. Only self-love and self-mothering can replace that. Well, okay. So it's, it can be challenging to grieve somebody that's still alive. And it's a different set of challenges grieving somebody that you've had a tumultuous relationship with when they when they've died. So either way, it's 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 its own set of challenges if they're still alive or if they've died. So if grieving your own mom, the loss of that relationship, um, while she's still living, I guess you start with acknowledging acknowledging how you feel kind of grieving it's grieving the loss of the the mother or the relationship with your mother that you wanted to have so there is a fantastic fantastic book called uh, the grief recovery handbook wonderful we should do a book club on it and there's a whole process that they have in there in terms of kind of messages that keep people stuck, messages about grief, messages, um, yeah, messages about grief, kind of maladaptive messages about grief that keep people stuck. And then there's a letter writing exercise at the, at the tail end. It's so incredibly powerful. It's just absolutely wonderful. So um, that might be a, a good exercise. So yeah, just acknowledging to start off acknowledging thing, acknowledging how you're feeling, acknowledging um, things that you're frustrated about, things that you're angry about, things that you're hurt about, things that you appreciate about her, things that um, you took away from your time together, both good or bad. Maybe it was I took away the fact that I would treat my that I never I don't deserve to be treated like that. And I will not be treated like that by anybody ever again. Um, yeah. So kind of covering all of the bases, all of that emotional territory can be very helpful. I know it might sound strange to, to talk about grieving in terms of something positive, like um, something that you're, that you're appreciative of or something that positive that you're taking away from the relationship, but it can help. And in the grief recovery handbook, it talks about that kind of finding the balance, seeing the humanness in another person. And it's not from a place of, oh, we need to have compassion for them or um, anything like that. It's, it's, it's so that we're not falling into, because when people are grieving the loss of something, they tend to slip into either idealizing that person, like, oh, this person was the, was an, was a saint. They were an angel. They kind of did no wrong. Or they slip into demonization. This person was absolutely horrible and kind of, they did nothing right. Uh, the problem with that is that that's very rarely the case. And that a big part of grief is uh, according to the grief recovery handbook, it's delivering that undelivered communication. So it's real, it's saying your piece across the board. And this, the letter that you end up writing, this is for you. It's not something to ever give to the other person because generally um, it, you know, you know, kind of uh, airing your grievances might help you to feel better, but giving them to the other person is just going to cause defensiveness and it's going to 
um, probably not go well. So uh, yeah, the, and you might even be able to find it if you Google the, the grief recovery process or grief recovery handbook process, there might be some information out there in terms of how to structure the letter. Cause they have, there's, like I said, there's a process that they, that they teach um, in terms of doing like a relationship graph and then kind of taking what you graph out and putting it in the letter format. It's, it's awesome. It's just really awesome. A uh, couple mom mentioned, was talking to Kayla saying, I think Dana has a book list on her website. I normally do, but I don't yet. We're updating the website. It was supposed to go live last month. <laughs> that didn't happen due to me. So hopefully this will happen next week. So, okay, let's see. And Kayla was asking, that reminds me, is there a place where Dana and or this group has compiled a list of go-to books on any of these topics? You know, I, I haven't organized my resources in terms of go-to books on any of these topics. I don't know why it's taken me seven years to do that, I have never thought of that until you mentioned it. So I'm going to copy your comment and I'm gonna make that happen because that's just sheer genius. <laughs> Why I never thought of that, I don't know. But uh, yeah, yeah, that's a, a freaking fantastic idea. I'm on, I'm on it, I'm on it. Okay. Let's see, let me scroll up here. You know, okay, so Refiner was saying that she had to grieve her own mother before she passed because that she lost her to dementia a number of years before she passed. She says, mind you, this was after I had reestablished a relationship with her. And that's the thing too with, with grief. Grief is a, grief is its own thing. And every relationship is different. Uh, with losing a losing someone to dementia or Alzheimer's, there was a book, a very popular book that came out, gosh, a while, like several decades ago, called The Long Goodbye, and it and it's about it's about that it's about all kind of dementia and Alzheimer's, and the title is so appropriate because that's exactly what it is, and so the grief process when you have a loved one, um, or even kind of a a less than loved one or somebody that you've had a tumultuous relationship with where there is this extended uh, disease process that happens. Um, at the end of that, there's going to be certain emotions that come up and in everybody experiences, you know, all relationships are different. There is no right or wrong with it. All the, all the emotions that come up are different. Um, but in relationships like that, or if the person has been incredibly abusive, uh, there can be a sense of relief after that. And a person can really feel uh, ashamed or like even like a monster for feeling that way. Like shame and embarrassment of, I can't, you know, I feel terrible for saying that I'm relieved by this. Um, you know, there's, there's anger, there's hurt, there's uh, shock, there's overwhelm, there's, there's just a lot. There's a lot when there's the, the, a loss of a relationship, either through a divorce or through a death or uh, yeah, anything in between. Okay, cool. Yeah, Jennifer says, I will bring up role-playing in my next therapy lesson. Thank you. Yeah, I will be curious to know how that goes. I, I hope, yeah, I will just be curious to know how that goes for you. Uh, you might want 
Jennifer, before you go in too, uh, to think of some different scenarios in the past of problematic people or situations, you know, coworkers, uh, strangers, family, you name it. It doesn't have to all be big situations, could be big, could be small situations that you look back on and you're like, gosh, you know, I, I feel like I should have been able to handle that differently or I'm frustrated at the way that I did handle it or maybe you were just curious as to know how asking your therapist, how do you think like what could I have done differently? Or how do you, uh, how do you think that this was handled? And so then that way you kind of have some scenarios, um, you know, uh, kind of prepared for your, se- for your session. So she's not so kind of uh, caught off guard by, by the concept. Leviathan Tad asks Dana, have you known of cases where emotional abusers stopped abusing or basically, or does abuse um, systematically escalate? I have never, here's the, okay. Again, this is one of those questions. It's a great question. It seems like a simple answer and it's not. So have I seen abusive people stop abusing? I have seen abusive people change how they are abusing. And this is where I think it really takes a a person, uh, you know, they have like batterer intervention programs. They have, uh, you know, couples therapists, um, uh, people that are that are working with with abusive people or the survivors of abuse, if they're not really, 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 really skilled in more subtle forms of abuse, out, if they're only familiar with physical abuse, okay, and a lot, and frankly, a lot of them are, or if they're only familiar with physical abuse or verbal, extreme verbal abuse you know, cussing, yelling, threatening, uh, just harsh belittling stuff that, you know, if you see it, if you see it unfolding in public, most people are going to be like, wow, that person's a jerk like that to that level, but more of like the, the covert or the stuff that flies under the radar as abusive, kind of the gaslighting, the invalidating, the withdrawing, the silent treatment, the, you know, um, more mild forms of physical abuse, uh, I say that in quotes because it's still it's still damaging. It's still sci- all abuse is psychologically dan- damaging. Um, then it can look like this person has stopped being abusive. Just because a person no longer hits their partner doesn't mean that they're not still abusive. Just because a person no longer um, you know screams at or belittles their partner, it doesn't mean that they're no longer abusive. And I don't think that's discussed enough. And because of that, there's a lot of um, people out there that is sort of like, oh, you know, this person stopped doing this behavior, uh, kind of everything is fine now. But generally, if you kind of, I don't know, if you, if you see it on YouTube or you kind of watch them interact, you're, you're still like, this relationship is still like, like abusive and profoundly dysfunctional. They're just not seeing it yet. And unfortunately, whoever's, um, you know, the, whoever, the therapist or whoever isn't picking up on this stuff either, or if they are picking up on it, they're just addressing it kind of one at a time. So that's the challenge with abuse is most people, most pe- most people, myself included, right? We all have this idea of what abuse is. And when people go into therapy, for a, a, a quote unquote problematic relationship, or even if they're able to identify that certain things are abusive, uh, there's just a lot to unpack. So th- odds are they're going in because of like this specific thing. You know, this person, they, they, they're they pushing me into having sex or they're just, they don't respect, um, they kind of don't take no for an answer or they they watch, they're very jealous or they watch my every move, 
uh, or they're putting me on an allowance, like this kind of stuff. And those certain behaviors might get addressed, but really at the core of that, see, that's the problem with abusive behavior. It's not the behavior itself. This might sound strange. It's not the behavior itself. That's the issue. It's the mindset that drives that behavior. That's the issue. And that's the power and control kind of domination over mindset. And that's deeply rooted and it, the roots go everywhere. It's, it's long lasting. So it's addressing it from the top down approach of, you know, it's not okay to, you know, hit somebody when you're frustrated. It's not okay to spit on somebody when you're frustrated. It's not okay to, you know, to stalk your spouse. It's not okay to, you know, um, verbally try to destroy them. Like it's all of that's playing whack-a-mole. You're, you're dealing with one issue at a time as it pops up. It can feel like progress but it's not because there's hundreds of thousands of little things waiting to pop up because it's the mindset when you're, when you've got a person that has a deeply pathological and deeply dysfunctional mindset like that, it's the way that they, it's their boundaries, their standards, their deal breakers. It's the level of entitlement. It's um, the way that they view the world and their place in it. That's the problem. And so this is why anger management itself does not work because that's not the issue. So th there's just a lot more to it. So have, like I said, I have never seen ab abusive people completely stop. I've seen them uh, change tactics. But again, it's challenging because being on the outside um, you're relying, so it depends on who you're working with. So like if you're working with the person who, who has the abusive behavior, um, the challenges are you're relying on them to self-report <laughs> and their self-report of what they consider to be abusive is going to be skewed. Right? So if you're working with the person who's been abused, Again, it's the same. You're relying on them to self-report what's going on. And if they're, if certain things aren't registering to them as abusive, they're, it's not going to occur to them that it's a problem or that it's abuse, that it's under the same umbrella as abuse. So there's just, there's a lot of challenges with that. With that being said, if, so for a person if you're on the receiving end of abuse, I wouldn't hold my breath to wait and hope for another, for a kind of a porcupine to become a kitten. You know, most people don't, I mean, if they were to ever kind of make a change like that, you're talking a very, 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 very long time because it's, like I said, it's not just one behavior. It's a whole way of being. It's like a personality transplant basically. And that takes a lot of work in therapy. They have to be highly motivated to do it. And, um, and it's challenging. I mean, nobody likes it's, it's, it's frustrating and it's exhausting and it's challenging for everybody involved, especially the person who is abusive. Um, because every, every week they'd go into therapy, they're basically being kind of confronted with, Hey, this is a problem. Hey, this is a problem. This is a, well, anybody is going to feel incredibly defensive with that. And there comes a point where you're like, God, I'm tired of being the bad guy. I'm tired of feeling attacked. Like I'm just done. So that's why they tend to shut down. Cause it kind of feels, because if they've been that way for any length of time, it's this, um, they might acknowledge certain things that are wrong, but we all have blind spots to our personality. So odds are they don't realize how deep it stems and how much they would need to, to really work on in order to, um, to not be abusive. So it's getting, like I said, there's just a lot, it, cutting through that defensiveness and, um, and all of that can be a challenge. So if you or somebody else is on, is more on the side of, oh gosh, you know what? I think I have, I think I have this abusive behavior and this is really concerning and I want to stop being that way. Then everything that I said still holds. I do believe that change is possible, but 
as I was saying, like, there's some real barriers to change present. And if you were to to want to work on your behavior, what I would encourage you, because like I mentioned, self-reporting behavior uh, is it's going it's going to limit. Um, it's going to it's it's just not going to be accurate. So, what can help? And this might sound kind of strange, but if if you're wanting things to change is to, and let's say there is, you know, you're like, gosh, I really don't handle certain situations. Well, I really want to change this behavior, whatnot. Um, and I, I know this might sound extreme, but I think it would really be helpful. Put cameras in your house, let your partner know, get on the same page with that and just say, I really, whenever we're disagreeing or whatever, I want to have this recorded. So then I can go show my therapist. And then that way your therapist has a more comprehensive picture of what's going on and that your therapist will be able to, to pick out. Um, and then both of you, or maybe even all three of you can kind of do this like post game day analysis of what happened. Uh, okay. How did things get to this level? Hopefully your therapist will be able to pinpoint, um, um, kind of help you increase the understanding and the vocabulary around it, come up with some different ways, explore, explore the mindset that's behind it. But like I said, most abusive people or most people with abusive behavior, uh, you know, it's, if they know what they're doing is wrong, if they feel entitled to do what they're doing, then they're not going to be motivated to, ch to change it because they don't think they have the problem because they feel entitled and justified. If they do know that they're doing something wrong, the challenge is that they can feel incredibly defensive and ashamed. So like I said, there's, there can be a lot there. Does that, that's, that was a long-winded response. Does that answer, <laughs> does that answer your question? Uh, okay, let's see. Jennifer says, I know when it comes to strangers, trusting your intuition is the main thing because who cares if you're wrong and displease them? They're not a part of your life. But when it comes to someone who you've trusted for so long, and then all of a sudden your intuition is questioning if something's wrong, how do you know if it's something to pay attention to or maybe something is off with you? Okay, this is where kind of... Uh, this is where increasing the kind of getting more familiar. And, and I would think that you probably do a good job with this because you've been here for a long time, but uh, kind of increasing your, increasing your understanding of the language of healing and is helpful. So instead of relying on your intuition as a guide, realize that you can rely on uh, your emotions. So if you're feeling uncomfortable, being able, and this is where that language of healing comes into play of, okay, well, what are, what's going on that is, is leading to you feeling uncomfortable? And at first we might feel like, I don't know. I don't know. It's just, there's something, there's a weird vibe. There's this, that, and the other. But if you kind of dig into it, a little bit more. And if we're able to increase that language of healing, we're like, mm, okay, you know what it is? It's they're staring at me a little bit too long, or they're interrupting me when I talk, or they're, um, they're just kind of like following out, following me out to my car, or they're a little too touchy feely, or they're making some comments that just that I find kind of off putting. So being able to articulate kind of what you're experiencing, um, then, then you'll know. Because when there's that feeling of something's off, it's generally that there's been some sort of boundary that's been crossed with us, but we don't have, we're either trying to minimize it, just, justify it, or deny it. And we're thinking, okay, well, that's not a really big deal. I don't have concrete proof of anything. So, and if we don't have that language of abuse or language of healing, then we're kind of left of like, I don't know, I just have this funny feeling, but I'm not sure. But when we do have that more expanded understanding of abuse and healing, then we're able to kind of pinpoint, oh, okay, yeah, it's, it's, 
you know, it's invalidation or they're stepping over my boundary or I'm not feeling heard or they're a little bit too close or um, these kinds of things. And then you realize, okay, it's not just, just this weird vibe that you're getting. It's these specific things that are going on that are making you uncomfortable. It's related to a boundary violation. And then kind of once you're able to better pinpoint, oh, okay, this is what's making me feel uncomfortable. Then you can take the steps to, to do something about it. And if you've known this person for a long time, this, if this is new behavior, um, you know, at, at a minimum, like you can either assert yourself or you can get some distance. That's kind of the options that we do in any, in any situation. And here's the thing too, you know, we talked about this when it comes to strangers, we're, you know, trusting your intuition is the main thing. It's, it's really not even about trusting your intuition. It's knowing that you don't need to be uncomfortable. That if you're uncomfortable, then there's some sort of boundary violation that's occurring. What we don't, we don't need to try to figure out that person's intentions whether, frankly, it doesn't matter whether they're family, whether they're a friend we've had for 30 years, or whether they're a complete stranger, their intention really doesn't matter because our boundary is our boundary. And if something is or isn't okay with you, then that's, that's it. Like that's not okay with you. And then we make that known. So when we're setting that boundary, when we're asserting ourselves, again, this is not coming from a place of um, punishing the other person. It's coming from a place of, I need to have peace in my life. Like, I don't want to walk around feeling agitated, upset, confused, frustrated, um, scared, any of that. Like, I don't want to feel that way. And so when I do feel that way, I need, I need to, something needs to give, like something needs to be done differently in order to um, smooth that feeling out. So with strangers, it's, you know, if I've given the, the example many times of like, you're walking in, a, you know, I don't know, you're walking out to your car and you hear somebody walking up behind you pretty quickly. And it's very off-putting, you know, it, and it, these kinds of things can be easy to justify, but what keeps a lot of us stuck is I don't want to be rude, you know, or I don't want the other person to feel bad. Um, or what, I don't want to overreact. Like that, those are the things that keep us stuck. But when we realize that it's, again, our boundary, it's not about the other person and we have no control over it. We have no control how they're going to interpret that. If they think that we're rude or that we're making a big deal out of nothing or that we're overreacting, we have to get to that place of that they're going to feel how they're going to feel about it. And that's okay. And that we have to get kind of learn practicing getting comfortable with with um kind of being uncomfortable so other people are going to feel how they're going to feel about your boundary frustrated upset angry hurt whatever but realizing that your boundary is not about them it's not about punishing them it's just about you and the more practice you get with that and the more you really believe that the more you really believe that that this is just a, a thing about you i don't you know uh if somebody's walking up quickly behind me, wherever I am, it's, uh, I don't like it. <laughs> so like I either turn around or I, I, you know, cross the aisle or I grab my keys or I do, I do something because I don't like it. And if somebody were to ask me and people have before, oh, come on, it's not that big of a deal or this, that, and the other, they're like, well, it's a big deal to me. Like, I don't, I don't like that feeling. So I'm not going to, why, like, why would I just torture myself and let and prolong this? It doesn't even matter. Like, it does not even matter if their intention, it, it could be a, a, it could be someone I've known forever. Um, it just stresses me out. So it's like, I just, I don't like it. So I'm not going to be a part of it. That's it. Not about making them bad or wrong or insinuating anything about them. It's, you don't like it, doesn't work for you. And that's it. Yeah. Dell says, yep. Boundaries are a hundred percent about us. 
Yes. Jennifer says, yeah, or it's the, I, well, I don't want to seem crazy. Yeah. So kind of examining. So when you're, I would encourage you, Jennifer, if you guys are going to role play in therapy, examine some of these limiting beliefs that are coming up that are keeping you stuck. We all have them. And if we're struggling with being assertive or setting boundaries, it's generally because some of these limiting beliefs are really steering our behavior. And identifying them is a big is a big part of the battle. So once we're able to pinpoint, oh, it's because I don't want people, I'm afraid they're gonna think I'm overreacting or I'm afraid they're gonna think I'm crazy or whatever. Once you kind of put a face to that fear, it's a lot easier to address. Because then it's sort of like, okay, then okay, so let's follow that through. So what? What what happens if they do think you're overreacting? But they say that, hey, I think you're overreacting. Oh, oh, you're making a big deal out of nothing. Okay. <laughs> Duly noted. I mean, you're, they, you know, people are going to have their opinion. That's okay. It doesn't mean they're right. And it doesn't mean that you have to change your approach. So, you know, um, uh, it's like if you were to have, if you were to go see a movie and the person that you're going with, you get to the movie theater and they say, oh yeah, we're going to go see, you know, slasher, you know, slasher flick three. Oh, it's, yeah, it's so gory. It's, you know, saw part 10. I don't know. Some you know, really disturbing movie. If you're not a fan of horror, and you're like, God, you know what? I just, man, I can't do horror. Like I stay, I just, I can't sleep for like a week on end. I get really anxious. I just, I, I, I don't enjoy it. Um, it's okay to be like, you know what? I don't want to see that movie. Can we see something else? And if they're like, no, I've been waiting for like three months now to see this movie. It's a really big deal. You know, Saw 10, man, this is going to be the best one yet. We've got to see it, blah, blah, blah. If, if you're like, I just, I can't, man. Like, I just, that's not, that's not my jam. Like, I'm going to be awake for a month after seeing this. And I just, that's, no, it's not good for me or my anxiety. Then if they don't want to see a different movie, then you end up going and seeing your own movie. You know, they can think how, what they want to think. Again, it's not to punish them. It's just to be like, yeah, these are some of my, my limits with this kind of stuff. It can, it takes time and practice to, to learn to let go of needing that other people to agree with us in order to feel validated. It can be very challenging, but I think realizing that there's very few times in life where all of the lights are going to be green, where all of the people in your life are going to be like, yes, Jennifer, you are doing the right thing. There's always going to be, uh, or the vast majority of time, there's going to be somebody who's going to play devil's advocate, or who's going to have a completely different opinion. And this is why it's so important for us to be able to validate ourselves and to, and to realize, hey, you know what, this does or doesn't work for me. And so I'm going to go take this course of action. That's it. Like, don't need to argue about it. Don't need to debate about it. Don't need to justify it. Nothing. Like, you do you. <laughs> like, I'm going to go do me because... I, you know, like I'm not trying to get dragged along and, and do stuff that I'm just uncomfortable with for no reason. There's no, there's no need for that. Um, okay. Josiah says, Dana, please help. I've had a few girlfriends with highly narcissistic tendencies and it's caused PTSD. I found a new girl. She has Asperger's, but it seems super similar to NPD. Any advice? Well, okay. So I guess a couple of things, a person, a person can have more than one thing going on. So a person can be on the, have an autism spectrum disorder as well as a personality disorder. So it's not necessarily one or the other. There can be both. With that said, even if 
she doesn't have a fallout personality disorder, if there's problematic traits that you're seeing there, it doesn't, it really truly doesn't matter what her diagnosis is. If it's uh, some sort of autism spectrum disorder, if it's, if she has PTSD, if um, she has dementia, she has bipolar disorder, it, it doesn't, it doesn't matter at the end of the day, because this goes back to you knowing kind of what's working for you in your life and then being able to communicate that to the people in your life. So if she's got some sort of problematic behavior, a big part of what makes the relationship work is effective communication. So it's not about necessarily finding like the perfect person. It's finding that good enough person to where when there's <clears throat> concerns that come up or there's clashes in personality or um, the, you know, just kind of things, things that come up that you're able, that both people are able to uh, bring them up and then effectively resolve them. If that's not the case in this relationship, if you're bringing stuff up and all of your concerns are getting met with defensiveness and um, um, yeah, like, like it's just kind of not, you're not feeling heard, you're, uh, nothing's really getting resolved. Um, there's kind of this, um, I don't know, lack of empathy or kind of cold, cruel or calloused level of indifference towards how her behavior fits you, then it's time to really do some soul searching and figure out, is this the kind of, is this the kind of person that you want in your life? Is this, is this person kind of relationship material? So, and I know that can feel, it can feel very judgmental um, at first, but it's not. It's very, the purpose of dating is to find out if there's enough compatibility for there to be in a partnership with this person. And in order to do that, we have to be discerning. And so if this person doesn't make a good fit for you for whatever reason, um, again, realizing that you moving on and, and going back to going back to kind of square one and dating again, this isn't that, that she's mean or bad or wrong or you know, any of these things, like we don't have to, to knock her down in order to make that decision valid for you. If it's not working for you, then it's not working for you. And in order for a relationship to be healthy, it's got to, it's got to have what it takes in order to be healthy. So it's got to work for you, you know? So, um, yeah. So I would get clear on kind of what's not working for you if you're able to communicate that to her, how she responds and uh, yeah, and then kind of go from there, getting, getting clear with yourself. And I would encourage in, anybody that's in a relationship to, to be thinking about this, like, okay, where, you know, it's not just about being able to assert ourselves and have boundaries. It's about the standards of, okay, what do we expect in a relationship? And is this relationship kind of meeting those expectations? And then where are the deal breakers? If, because at some point there needs, in order for a relationship to, to move forward, there has to be re resolution of certain issues. And if things are not getting resolved, if it's, you're going around that mountain time and time and time again, um, or if new issues keep being added in that, like it's, if it's just not working, getting clear with yourself of, okay, well, when am I going to cut bait and drive on? At what point does it become a deal breaker? So getting clear with yourself over what kind of changes that you need to see in this relationship and in what kind of time frame. So, okay. Let's see. Let me scroll up here.
Jennifer says, my sister, who's been around my whole life, is majorly manipulative, according to my boyfriend and therapist. It's so hard for me to see, I think, because of her being in my life since the beginning. My boyfriend says he sees it not only in her repetitive actions, but also in her eyes. I don't see it in her eyes. It's so hard and disappointing and sad. Yeah. It, I mean, and you're spot on. It's really difficult for us to see something that's a problem when like, it's always been that way. It's always been in our life. It's like the saying goes, it's the last thing the fish notices is the water. You know, when you, when you've been in a situation for long enough, it just becomes normal. And, um, and, and because of that, it can be very difficult to, to see problematic behavior clearly. With that said, if he, I wouldn't worry about kind of seeing manipulative behavior in her eyes. I, you know, I see this kind of, I've, heard this kind of stuff a lot. And the reality is sometimes people see stuff and sometimes people don't in, in facial expressions or um, whatever, you know, you hear people, all oh, this psychopath has kind of this dead look in their eyes or um, this person just had a very flat affect. And like, I could tell that something was off because of just their, their lack of, of emotional responses. Like, yes, sometimes that can be the case but sometimes it's not. And so body language, facial expressions, you know, aren't the, um, I, I guess I just, I wouldn't, especially if it's somebody that you've been around your whole life, I, I wouldn't worry about, I wouldn't even give a second thought to the fact that you're not, maybe not picking up on certain body language cues that they are. I wouldn't worry about that. I would, what I would be, what I'd spend more time and attention on is the repetitive action. That's something more that you can pinpoint. Because again, like facial expressions, body language, that kind of stuff, that's a lot more um, um, subjective than it is objective. Actions you can point to and say, okay, yeah, this is, I told her no. And I, you know, she asked if she could borrow my dress. I said no. And she borrowed it anyhow when I was in the bathroom. Um, you know, stuff that kind of establishes a pattern of she doesn't really have respect for your boundaries, or she doesn't take no for an answer, or um, she doesn't get her way, she starts crying, or she threatens suicide, or she, you know, does something else like th these kinds of things. Problematic, problematic behavior is, uh, yeah, focus, focus on examining and, and spotting that and then practice responding accordingly. Uh, Leviathan Tad says, oh, thanks, Dana. Yeah, you were a great help. It's my ex and has been for two years now. Oh, the person, the abusive person changing. That was the original question. Uh, but how do I, be uh, but I do believe he has suffered and is suffering for how he treated me. Well, and that might very well be. But um. This is kind of where boundaries come into play. Like even if the person is, even if the person is remorseful, this doesn't mean that you have to let them back into your life. And at a minimum, before you would even enter, like I here here's the thing: relationships, it's one thing. We can only any person can only do so much healing outside of a relationship. Relationships have the ability to activate any one of us uh, in ways that other situations don't. The relationships that you have with a significant other um, are like way more activating than the relationships we have with the coworker or something like that. So for, for that reason, a person might be, you know, kind of ha might have this clarity, like, okay, how I acted, this was not okay. And this was a problem and this, that, and the other doesn't mean necessarily that that behavior has been resolved within them. So just having kind of having remorse um, isn't, isn't a sign of changed behavior. Changed action is a sign of changed behavior. But unfortunately, in these situations, the only way to really see if there's a changed action 
is to bring that person back in your life that have that emotional bond reestablished and then see if they're, um, you know, activated and all that. This is why there's a, a lot to be said for having healthy boundaries and realizing, okay, that person might feel terrible or whatever, but, um, you know, if they were incredibly abusive, there has to be a point where it's like, you know what, I might love you and care about you, but man, I got to love me and care about me and I can't risk it. Like, yeah, there's, there's some stuff there. Or if you do decide to bring that person back in your life, realize that, um, yeah, realize that you matter. And, um, if that's that, I, I don't know. <sighs> I wouldn't even recommend it because the odds that they resolved all, all of the issues across the board, it's just, it's pretty much slim to none. And I guarantee you that the stuff that, that you see as a problem and the stuff that they see as a problem, there's still going to be a disconnect there because just simply because it's really difficult for the person who's being hurtful to, to see all of their hurtful behavior because they're not on the receiving end of it. That goes for any one of us. So it's just, yeah, it's a, it's a lot there. But thank you, Josiah, for the live stream donation. I appreciate it. Um, let's see, let me scroll up here. Um, <laughs> scrolling, scrolling, scrolling. Oh, I also wanted to touch on that a little bit, Jennifer. She said, the kind of the final part of her question of with someone, how do you know if your intuition's kind of going off? Um, how do you know if it's something to pay attention to, or maybe something is off for you? Uh, yeah, I, I guess just to kind of reiterate, if if we're grounded in realizing if. If we realize that we don't want to be uncomfortable and that feeling any level of kind of uncomfortable emotion, it's worth examining, it's worth addressing, especially with another person, especially if we don't feel this way around everybody. So you can kind of tell like, okay, is there an issue? Is it me or is it them? Asking yourself, well, do you feel this way around other people? If you feel this way around uh, like I would say lots of other people, especially people that have proven themselves to be emotionally safe in the past. If you're feeling this way around people that are emotionally safe, then it, it's something to, yeah, then it could be something within you that's worth looking at. I, I would say that that's, that is more the exception by far than the norm, like 90 probably 95% of the time, if not 99% of the time, when we're feeling uncomfortable around somebody, we tend to not feel that way all the time. We tend to not feel that way around the vast majority of people. And we do tend to feel that way around people that are doing something that's crossing some sort of boundary with us. So I know it can be very dysregulating if a person's struggling with PTSD or um, CPTSD, or they're like, I don't trust my judgment, or I'm continually questioning my judgment. But that can be kind of a good gut check of, okay, like, who else have you felt this way around? And, and even that can be a little bit challenging. So like, for example, when people are, are normally like, reasonably close, reasonably fresh out of an abusive relationship. Um, 
you know, abusive relationships are confusing relationships and they're confusing because there's, you're dealing with a pathological mindset that twists reality. And it's, and it's, it's emotionally and psychologically abusive. Sometimes it's intentional. Sometimes it's not intentional. Sometimes you just get caught up in the pathology of another person who has a very skewed outlook on the world and their place in it. And because of that, when we're interacting uh, with other people, it can cause us to really second guess things because if you've been around somebody with that pathological mindset, it's the opposite. You're in upside down land, right? It's like the wizard of Oz, like what's down is up and what's up is down and kind of everything is your fault and nothing makes sense. And things that are a problem you're being told aren't a problem. And it can take a while to, to become more regulated after that. And this is one of the ways to do that is to spend time around people that have, that you've already established, uh, that are emotionally safe. And so you can kind of just get, get your equilibrium back and realize, okay, um, you don't always feel this way all of the time and um, getting grounded within yourself of, okay, I, I know what it feels like when I feel calm. I know what it feels like when I feel, um, you know, upset or, or dysregulated. So and I think I'm going to wrap up here pretty soon, guys. I wasn't feeling very good at all today, but let me do one more question and then we'll do a, a, a guided imagery. Or, yeah, <laughs> guided meditation. That's what I meant to say. And then call it a night. Okay, Monica has a question. Let's see, I wanna see if that is in fact. Okay, Monica says, my boss made a sick offer to me that if I slept with him, he would promote me on my job. I worked for Microsoft and I made an official complaint to them. Now it's gotten so uncomfortable at my workplace. Everyone is like, why did you make it such a big deal? Um, let me scroll, scroll, scroll. He brushed his hand up my skirt during a meeting and I stood up and slapped him. Everyone thinks I made it a big deal and that he just had a playful nature that I just overreacted. Well, um, yeah, that's horrifying that people think that, that you're making a big deal out of nothing. Any type of unwanted, especially physical contact is, is never okay. And that, I mean, that's like, a, that's egregious, right? For somebody to, to touch you, um, you know, that's not even in the realm of like, oh, that could be an accident. If a person's brushing your hands up your skirt, that kind of thing. Um, yeah, that's, that's not okay. If other people don't see that that's a problem, then that's on them. I mean, you're doing the right thing. That's definitely something that's worth escalating. Um, and I would document it, uh, these kinds of things. People minimize behavior all the time. I mean, that's, that's pretty extreme. I'm surprised that people are, are minimizing that as a, chalking it up as a playful nature. Um, but if it's a big deal to you, it's a big deal to you. And it's completely reasonable and appropriate to, to be like, you know what, I don't, I don't want unwelcome uh, sexual advances. I mean, this is uh, like, you know, nobody does. Nobody does. So yeah, that's outrageous and uh not something that can be chalked up to, to anything other than like a really egregious boundary violation. So yeah. Oh, well, thank you. Cynthia says, thank you. And with a live stream donation, I appreciate that very much. So 
So, okay, well, with that said, let's, yeah, let's go into a, um, take some time to just get settled into the present moment and just relax and decompress. And then we'll wind down for tonight. So find a spot that is comfortable, whether you're sitting down or lying down. where you're able to take a deep breath in through your nose and out through your mouth. Allowing yourself to fully settle into this moment. Feeling the weight of your body as you begin to relax. And with each breath, feeling your chest easily and effortlessly rise and fall. Bringing that breath down into the bases of your lungs and down into your stomach. Feeling even more of your body easily and effortlessly rise and fall. and allowing that heaviness of your body to continue as you release the stresses of the day or of the week. And allowing yourself to become fully present in this moment Taking some time to just remind yourself that you know, you know what feels nourishing to you and that you know what feels draining. And that for the things in life that feel draining, that oftentimes these are signs of, of slight imbalances, things that need some tender loving care on your end with some boundaries. And continuing to breathe. And just reminding yourself that you are worthy of protecting and that you are competent and capable in so many ways. That there are so many things that are good and right about you. That you are worthy of living a good life, that you are worthy of having peace and sanity in your life, that you are worthy of having nourishing relationships, that you are worth protecting, that you are worth valuing and that you are worth loving. And 
and continuing to breathe. You are competent, you are capable, you are a lifelong learner. There are so many things that you're doing well. You've come such a long way. Taking some time to just acknowledge that. To acknowledge how far you've come. Noticing how resilient you are and how capable you are. That so many of these situations and these feelings can be really, really painfully difficult and that you've been able to handle them. And that you've handled them in the best way that you could at the time. And that every day in every way you are growing. And that your skills are growing. There is so much that is good and right about you. So visualize just giving yourself a big hug, knowing that you can do hard things. That you are worthy of the good things in life. And that you are just doing a great, great job. That you've come a long way. Because it's true, you have. You have. You are worthy of love. You are worthy of value. You are worthy of being treated with respect and dignity. You are competent. You are capable. So many things that are good and right about you. And when you're ready, come on back and open your eyes. So thank you for joining us this evening. And I hope to see you next week. If you would like to be notified when I go live, uh, you can always subscribe to the channel, but YouTube can be kind of fickle with delivering notifications. So you can subscribe to the text, um, I don't know what you call it, the text notification system by texting the words Dana Live, all one word, to the number 22999. And if you're looking for some words of encouragement, I send them out about three times a week. You can text the words I thrive, all one word, to the number 22999. So it's just a, yeah, a little thing that we started doing. And I, yeah, I hope it just kind of helps you through, through the week to keep uh, on a, just realize that you're not alone and um, that, that you can do this. So with that said, just lots of love to you guys. You are not alone. You are not crazy. 
and you really can move forward and heal from this. So take care and um, yes, have a lovely week. I'll see you soon. Okay, good night.